Right. Hope you guys enjoyed that. It, uh, to put it lightly, I'm not the best a shooter, so that three minutes of somewhat quality, pretty mediocre B-roll took about seven hours of shooting and about forty-five thousand dollars worth of fun. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, again, took a lot of time and effort to put this together. So I hope you all enjoyed it. Again, I'm gonna try to get better as we go on. This is the first time I've actually even put thought into making a video, so. Bear with me and let me know what you think. I would really appreciate that. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm going to get really into the minutia of this gun. Um, but uh, I just want to say I put about a thousand rounds to this. And um, yeah, uh, so I put a thousand rounds, steel case through this, suppressed all of it. And I experienced one singular malfunction. Uh, that malfunction was a double feed and it was actually the last magazine, uh, go figure. And I was kind of just, literally I just grabbed it and I popped it off. Um, and I was using uh, US, USGI mags, uh, I'll show you guys. Um, the, these mags are likely older than me, I got them in the army, it's the same old spring, so do we want to chalk it up to the fact that uh, this gun isn't reliable? It's really up to you. I know your Anderson has 45,000 concurrent rounds that are perfect, but uh, this currently is experiencing 99.9% .9 uh, reliability rating at, on this range session with uh, Wolf steel case. So. That's the reliability out of the way, um, but yeah, uh, I'm going to break this into segments and I'm going to try to make it nice and easy to swallow for you and uh, that way if there's something you had a particular question on, you can just skip forward to that aspect and you don't have to hear me rabble. So let's jump right into it. Alrighty, so in the order I'm going to be showing it, we're going to start here with the rear end, the most important end to many of us. Um, I have on this a SBA3 with a wise man split fix. Uh, I don't really want to, I don't want to dive too much into uh, why I have a brace as opposed to a stock uh, and the legality and so on and so forth. Needless to say, um, the BATF has determined your inalienable rights are uh, not inalienable. So, uh, in order for you to have a barrel under the length of 16 inches and not have to register it and pay another tax, which I have paid many of and I'm really not in the mood to pay more of, um, you got to use a brace, a pistol brace, and you're not supposed to intentionally be shouldering these rifles. I don't want to get in the legal thing. Needless to say, I use a brace. I use This is an AR pistol build. If that is what you're going for, the SBA3, in my opinion, is the best. The Wiseman Split Fix really allows um, storage of the brace um, to be much more um, easy. Well, and I'll put it at that. You can go ahead and do your Googling and, and learn about the Wiseman Split Fix. Really good product. The SBA3 is the most attractive looking brace um, as well as the most functional um, when being stored with the Wiseman Split Fix. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, moving forward, uh, though, underneath this, this beautiful buffer tube here um, is actually going to be something called a A5 length, AKA a rifle length or so, um, Veltor uh, buffer system. Let me pop that out here. 
and uh, show you guys what's inside. But uh, essentially what this means is I don't have a carbine length buffer. On, on shorter rifles, traditionally speaking, you're gonna have a carbine length buffer. And uh, I don't, I have something called the A5 system. And if you're not familiar with what that is, is, um, oh, I wish I brought it. Uh, I actually don't own any more carbine buffers. I've gotten rid of all of mine and switched all my ARs over. So I don't have an example, but essentially speaking, you, a carbine buffer will end about here. You get about, I don't know, so, somewhere about this much more um, buffer length. And what that does is it allows your bolt, when it's cycling, to have a longer path into the stock and so instead of stopping here, it gets to stop back here. So it's a longer travel, well, not really, there's the buffer in here. But anyway, there's a longer travel that the bolt can go into your buffer tube. And what that longer travel does is it gives it more time to slow down. So that way when it gets to the point of no return or it gets to the point where the spring pressure is larger than the bolt pressure able to push the force back, it's slower. More or less, I'm making up a lot of words to explain. It softens and slowers the recoil impulse, and that directly correlates to you getting a softer shot. This is one of the biggest improvements that you can make to your rifle that is actually noticeable. 90% of what we do is cosmetic. This is a feature that moving on, every rifle should have the A5 system. It's awesome, and it's a wonderful system, and it will, and it absolutely is noticeable. Um, I wasn't a believer until I got into it about two years ago. Um, I got internet bullied into trying it out and it absolutely is a huge difference and I highly recommend it. Um, not only do I have that system in here, let me pull this apart. My hands are gonna get filthy throughout this process because um, again, I just shot this a lot. Um, Inside here, this is the Geisley Super 42 spring. This is the Vel Veltor, um, I don't even remember which one I bought. Uh, this is the A5 H2. Um, what that actually means is completely irrelevant because uh, I'll get into the buffer first. So again, like I said before, we have a different buffer system inside of here. And what that buffer system means is um, you have the ability to put a longer buffer in. This is an A5 buffer made by Veltor. What that is, is it's a little bit longer. It's not quite rifle length, but it's a little bit bigger and has one more weight. Usually there's three weights in here, this has four. So it has more weight in this. And what's cool about buffers, if you weren't familiar, is uh, there's gonna be three weights in here. They're either gonna be steel or tungsten. Um, one's heavier than the other, so you can switch them around. And that's where you get the difference between an A1, A2, A3 buffer as well as with rifle. Uh, rifle length buffers have four. So this is a little bit bigger than a carbine length, a little bit smaller than a rifle length, but still has the same weight as a rifle length, more or less. And what that does, again, more weight. When that bolt slams back into your shoulder, there's more weight that it has to move. And because there's more weight there ha that it has to move, it's gonna not be able to put as much kinetic energy into your shoulder. And it's gonna be a slower, longer recoil impulse AKA less felt recoil. And what's cool about this is I suggest it doesn't really matter what weight you buy because what I do is I go on KAK, you can Google them. Um, they sell them and a lot of places sell buffer weights. Go ahead and grab you a pack of four tungsten and four steel buffer weights. And what that's gonna allow you to do is you can drive, there's a roll pin in here. You can drive that roll pin out and you can tune your buffer. I do it with all of them, I've always done it, and it's no different with the Veltor system. You don't need to buy a bunch of different buffers and try them out to see which one works for you. You can make your own. That being said, actually, I think it's the A3. One of these comes with, um, the problem is, with the A5 system, it's a little itty bitty different than the carbine or rifle system, as um, one of these buffers has actually a spring in it, and that spring pushes against this, because if you hear, this doesn't jiggle, because it's actually, uh, there's a spring in there. That is not a necessary fart or function. It just kind of eliminates that. So again, if you own the steel weights and you own the tungsten weights, you can make this whatever buffer you want and you can tune it to your rifle. And I will do a whole series on tuning and suppressor tuning your rifle. If that's what you're interested in, let me know. Again, I'm not trying to kill you with this information overload if you're a newer shooter. And if you're an experienced shooter, you probably know everything I'm saying. But if any of this is something that you wanted me to deep dive into, please let me know. But I really did want to do a whole series on suppressor tuning. Speaking of suppressor tuning, what a lot of people do is like with the what would sooner do uh, 
2017, whatever the build that they're selling now, they're selling something called the JP Capture Spring. And if you're not familiar, again, I have no traditional springs anymore. I have Spring Co, which actually don't really twang that much. And I have these, these guys, these Super 42 Springs. I've never had the opportunity to use the JP Capture Spring because I haven't really seen the point in it. Um, I know a lot of people don't like that twang, but what's really cool is a couple years back, Geisley made this. This is a Super 42. It's a braided wire spring. And you're gonna ask yourself, why not just a regular buffer? Well, for a lot of people, they don't know this. Buffer springs are probably the quickest wearing part on a rifle aside from the magazine. Buffer springs, um, due to it being a single wire spring and due to the nature of it, there, there is a shelf life on it. What's cool about that braided wire that I just showed you is its shelf life is gonna more than likely be longer than the life of the barrel. And so when you buy a Geisley Super 42, you're getting like a seven or eight times shelf life on your, your spring, as well as it completely, I can't really stimulate, simulate it um, with the part in half. Um, it, it, it completely eliminates the twang. That twang that you guys are annoyed by, the Super 42 does. So a lot of people use that JP Capture spring. Uh, I don't even know if they make a rifle length, I'm sure they do. But this is the Geisley Super 42 rifle length. It eliminates the twang, there's significantly less moving parts, and it has a significantly longer shelf life than any other system. And it's about a third of the cost of the JP Capture. So it does everything that that does for less money. So it's a really, really good feature. Um, it, it's awesome. For some rifles though, it has actually a little bit too much spring pressure. In my 16 inch, I, uh, I use a spring coat green. Um, but again, suppressor tuning and tuning your rifle to your ammunition is something I would love to do a video on. I've spent the last couple years experimenting and um, I like to think that I get my rifle softer shooting than most because I'm a terrible shooter, but as you can see, I can make very mediocre B-roll. <laughs> All right, so uh, that's enough for the, oh, there's one more thing on this back end that I would like to talk about. Um, so I don't know how well you're gonna be able to see this, but this, my friends, is called the PWS Ratcheting Castle Nut. So if you're not familiar, uh, your castle nut is going to traditionally uh, be attached here and your castle nut will get staked. You need to stake your castle nut. Loctite does not work. Um, th this area of the rifle will experience is entirely too much recoil, not to mention if you Loctite it, you're not getting it off more than likely. Don't wanna to get too much into it, but you need to do something called staking it. And what that essentially means is you're gonna see little cutouts here and you're gonna to have to push some material from the nut, or sorry, from the base plate into the nut so that way it cannot unscrew itself. This system does not need that. Uh, it has a ball detent in the bottom here. It's gonna be very difficult for me to show you on camera, but more or less, it has a mechanical feature inside that you cannot loosen this unless you get enough force to actually break that detent, which you need an actual uh, tool to do. So what's cool about that is it improves reliability in the aspect of, um, well, it doesn't improve, a properly staked uh, castle nut will never come out. Problem is, is when you break that stake, um, there's only, you can only do it so many times before you actually have to replace the, the castle nut. It's not an expensive thing. It's not a hard process. Just go get a center punch. It's not difficult, but again, this can come off and on as many times as you want. So uh, you don't really need to take it apart pretty much ever once you get it on there but it's a really nice feature to have, plus it includes a quick detach um, point back here. I don't know if you can see it, the QD's part for your sling. So again, one less tool to buy. It might be a little bit more expensive than a traditional castle nut, but it, if you add in the fact that if you don't own a center punch, you gotta go out and buy one, it saves you a little bit of money. And frankly, for me, I love tinkering with my builds. I move these around. Um, this is probably the only really setup that has stayed together in one point and not changed in a long period of time, um, and yeah. I highly recommend you look into that if you're building. That's a little, really, creature comfort that uh, I think will really help improve your build. So, enough about this little section. I'm gonna move on to the next, and I apologize again. I told you I'm getting long-winded. Questions, comments, leave them below. What's going on guys? All right, if you're still sticking around here and uh, you wanna keep diving in, I appreciate that. So now we're gonna move on to the next section. Again, uh, I will get really deep into this, so I apologize. Um, so this is my lower, it's an Aero M4E1 lower. Uh, this is a forged lower with a lot of billet features. 
Long story short, there's two processes of building lowers. One comes in a solid block of steel and they chisel it out. The other is forging. I don't wanna to get too far into it, but this is a very unique lower and it's inexpensive. Um, billet lowers usually are 150 plus and uh, forgings are usually pre-COVID different. With COVID now, I'm seeing about 60 to 70 bucks. This is about 85, it's about $15 more and it provides a little bit more feature set that you're not gonna see on a forged lower, even though this is forged. So don't get, this This looks like it's a billet, it's got some cosmetic features. It's something that only a major company like Arrow can do. If you have more questions about that, leave a comment below and I'll try to answer them. I don't wanna get too far into forgings and why your Anderson is not the same as a company that came from the same forge. Don't wanna get into it. That's a whole nother video. If you're interested, I can go and do a deep dive into that. But anyway, this is a forged receiver that has a flared magwell and included elongated and skeletonized um, trigger guard. It's gonna have, um, uh, instead of roll pin uh, for your bolt catch, it's gonna actually be a set screw. And uh, the only other really features are more of cosmetic than anything. So those are the major features, the flared magwell, the uh, trigger guard, and it's gonna not use roll pins and use set screws. If you're building at home and you do not have a vise, I highly, highly, highly recommend you get a set screws type, more than likely not this, because if you're building on your kitchen table and you don't have the proper tools, you're gonna mar your finish pretty badly. It's hard to get a roll pin down and without roll pin punches and a proper vise. Um, so if you're okay with marring your finish, go ahead and do it on your kitchen table. Just again, I recommend getting roll pin punches. But again, that all starts adding up, whereas all this needs is an Allen key that is included. So when you're starting to budget and you're, you're doing your build, just remember that. Um, as far as uh, some of the features that I have added, um, I do use a buffer retainer. Uh, you actually don't need one. Um, in range is a whole thing on that, so a lot of people don't use them now. It, get a titanium one, it's like $2. It will not break, it's actually stronger than the receiver itself. I don't wanna get into it. Um, but yeah, I use a buffer retainer. It makes disassembly and reassembly a little bit easier, and it's the way that got and Eugene designed the rifle. Um, <laughs> uh, moving forward, I have an Ambi selector. Um, it is on a uh, 45 degree throw now. This is a Seeking Precision's Ambi selector. What's really neat about it is it is actually uh, interchangeable. Uh, one side is 90 degrees, the other is 45. If you're a new shooter and you don't know what I'm talking about, essentially, see this, it's, it's breaking at 45 degrees. Traditionally speaking, you have to rotate it uh, another 45 degrees until 90 um, and there's a couple reasons why this is better. Um, for starters, on your uh, right side, a lot of people actually remove this because when you bring it to 90 degrees, it actually starts to hit your trigger finger, whereas at 45, it doesn't, which is really nice, um, as well as it's a shorter throw, shorter throw is faster. 90 degree and 45 to me is, I, I don't really notice too much of a difference, but what I do like is uh, when you have it at that shorter throw too, you can actually rest your finger on it, um, and it kind of is just a nice little point of reference, whereas the 90 degree, again, it just gets in the way. Um, Seeking's Precision, it's a pretty inexpensive ambi selector. Almost all the ambis are the same. This one isn't plastic. It is, um, I'm assuming MIM, I, I can't really tell. Um, it is metal. Um, but yeah, it's a nice little um, selector. Does its job really well. And uh, it, again, it, that interchangeability is a really good price point. Um, feature for those of you who are new or have never tried a 45 degree, you might not like it. If you've trained up on a 90 degree or if you're a new shooter, that 90 degree actually is a little bit safer because it's a little bit harder to engage. Um, moving on, below it, I have a Magpul K1 grip. If you're not familiar with all the different letterings and such on the grips, um, I'm gonna make it kind of brief. If you're a newer shooter getting into AR-15s, I recommend this grip, the, the K1. Uh, more or less, uh, there's gonna be different grip angles and they serve different purposes. Traditionally, older and uh, more contemporary AR grips, we're gonna have more of a cant to be designed for you to lay down and shoot prone um, or from a more supported position. This is a more 90 degree, it's, it's brought in a little bit more and it allows, especially on these shorter rifles because braces do have a shorter length of pull, don't wanna get into it, shorter rifles, um, having this more uh, 90 degree angle is gonna allow you to have a more uh, natural wrist um, placement and it's gonna allow you to shoot from uh, non-standard positions, in my opinion, more comfortably, um, as well as it lines up your finger with the trigger and uh, 
slight safety selector in a more natural position. Everyone's hands are different. Some people might not like this, but vast majority of shooters that I know um, use this grip. And um, I got, again, internet bullied into trying it out. And uh, I used to be just an old um, Magpul guy, uh, just use their traditional uh, MOE grips. And I switched to this and even my precision rifles. I really, really like these. Um, so yeah, uh, this is my favorite grip. Other great options are again, just the standard Magpul. I do not recommend getting a standard uh, grip just because the finger groove in there, um, it's kind of a shot in the dark. Some people it fits, some people it doesn't. Granted, I used one for many years in the military and I enjoyed it. So again, grip is one of those things. It's very inexpensive um, and the resale on them is almost the same as buying it new. So you can't really go wrong. But again, this is a Magpul K1. I really enjoy it. And um, um, by the way, I forgot to mention all this is Cerakoted done by me. You can't buy it in these colors, I don't think. But yeah, I did the Cerakote. Another video for another time. <laughs> uh, in front of that, uh, you see the trigger here. This is a Wisely SSPE. The E stands for enhanced, which means lightning bow or short bow. Geisley has some weird, super cringe names, but uh, the E enhanced, whatever, it, it's, a, it's a flat trigger. Um, so traditionally triggers are curved. Uh, it's kind of an older design. Uh, flat triggers uh, allow it to be a straight lever so you can pull um, further down the trigger. The further down the trigger you pull, the more leverage you have. The more leverage you have, the less felt um, tension you're gonna have. Lighter trigger pull that you will experience. Though the trigger pull will have the same resistance, you won't need to use less strength on your finger because you have more leverage. Long story short, I recommend flat face triggers for everyone, everything. There's really no drawbacks. So um, unless you're used to a curved trigger, if you have the ability to get a flat face trigger, I recommend it. As far as what trigger to buy, the Geisley SSP, in my opinion, is the best carbine trigger. Um, it is something called a single stage. I don't wanna get too into this. Triggers, again, are a whole nother video. I could do a 45 minute video, explain this, that, and the other, and explain why spending $70 on like a Sons of Liberty gun work enhanced trigger is kind of ridiculous when you can just buy a mil spec trigger and change the springs and it's the exact same thing. I don't wanna get into it, but, People ask me what my favorite trigger is. For each application, it might change a little bit. For 90% of things now, I'm really enjoying single stage triggers. They're gonna be faster, easier to teach. You don't have to teach people about the two stages. You know, you, gotta, you don't pull through a stage during fast shooting. Don't wanna to get too much into it in this video. But this SSP is a very expensive, but in my opinion, the very best. And according to Geisley, scientifically proven, not making this up, is the fastest trigger ever to be produced. It's awesome. It'll be way faster than you are, and it'll make your shots look really cool. So, yeah, that's the trigger I got in this. Um, the only other thing I have really on here is, oh, actually there's two more things here. On this side, I have the Geisley um, Maritime Bolt Catch. I love it. Um, basically what it does is, if you're not familiar with a traditional bolt catch, you just have this, and then you have a little dingus at the top. But when you reload, um, traditionally speaking, um, you're gonna raise your thumb, and you're gonna tap the bolt release. And what this does is it gives you a larger target um, for conditions when you have gloves on. Um, this is again in a maritime environment uh, is what it was designed for with water, it's more slippery, but it's just gonna allow you to have a bigger target to hit with that thumb as you're going forward. Or if you're reloading offhand here, you can actually finger it, um, which is really nice. It just, it's a bigger target. And um, if I ever get into some more uh, videos, I don't wanna train too much, I'm not really sure. <laughs> It's not really my thing, but I um, can explain it. it. It really does provide a massive functionality change to AR-15s as opposed to the mil spec. I highly recommend it. I do not recommend the bad levers. That is another video for another time, but I can do a whole video of why the bad lever is a terrible design. It might improve your split times, but it also might get you to shoot something, someone. Also, it is a failure inducing product because whole freaking set of complaints about the bad lever. Please don't buy them. I fell for it when I first started and then I saw some really good data by some really good people on why you shouldn't use them. Anyway, uh, moving on here, uh, this is a Norgun's ambidextrous magazine release. So traditionally speaking, uh, on ARs, they're really only designed for right-hand shooters. On this side, it has a mag drop 
and on this side it's just a slick bar. What this is is essentially a feature that allows me to um, press in here if I'm shooting offhand left and you, it'll drop your magazine. So again, I'm a big proponent of ambidextrous everything if possible, uh, whether or not you're a left or right hand shooter, you never know when you need to shoot with offhand. So uh, this is a inexpensive item. I think there's a bunch of, they're patent expired, so there's a bunch of really inexpensive, cheap copies of it um, all over. Brownell sells some really good ones. Check them out. Uh, again, just look up ambidextrous magazine catches. Uh, I do not recommend the Troy one. I've messed around with those and I've had some failures with them. Um, yeah, the only other thing that is left on here is these takedown pins. And I got Strike Industry takedown pins because it makes people angry. Alrighty, boys and girls. I am now gonna move on to my upper. And um, before I get in the upper, I wanna talk about what's under the hood there and probably the most important part of your gun. Uh, when you're budgeting your gun, uh, there's three things that you need to budget for and everything else comes later. And that's gonna be your barrel, bolt, and optic. The three most essential things that will make the rifle function. Everything else you can use mil spec and you'll be just fine. This is not a mil spec bolt. Uh, this is something called a, a CMC enhanced bolt. And I want to start by talking about enhanced bolts. So traditionally speaking, enhanced bolts like Surefire, they sell this bull crap of it doesn't tilt. Um, there are AR-15s that I have literally gone through in the military that have been kicked around by 17 and 18 year olds for 20 years. And the only thing that needs to ever be changed on these damn things, which they never change anyway, and even so, was the buffer. Mil spec bolts tilt. There's not that big of a deal with it. It's not gonna cause issues if you have a good lower and upper. It is an unnecessary feature, but what it does do is it does slow the decay of your rifle and it apparently increases reliability. I don't buy into that, but generally speaking, people buy in because it's the new selling point. It's a sales feature, don't buy into it, but this is a bolt that doesn't tilt. The other thing is this is a nitrided bolt as opposed to melanite, which the military uses. I will say that is a nice feature. What that allows is, I don't know if you can see this, but literally I just pulled it out. This, if, you, if you've ever shot a suppressed 11.5 or any gun suppressed for that matter, especially short direct impingement rifles like these, they get caked. I literally just took a shop rag and wiped it and it is all clean. So that's a feature that people buy. I don't think it's necessary. Um, if you're really worried about um, cleaning your gun and you're having issues doing it, instead of spending an extra $100 on an improved bolt, Go to Harbor Freight, spend $20 on something called an ultrasonic cleaner, and you'll never get your guns cleaner. It's awesome. I love them. Anyway, moving on. Why did I buy an enhanced bolt carrier? It wasn't for the finish, although it's nice. It wasn't for the anti-tilting functions, which is nice. Don't need them. What it was is actually this has a couple things that's really neat about it. The CMC bolt, for starters, is a really good price. Um, it also is HPMP. Uh, and it is shot peened. I don't want to get too far into it, but more or less it has all the testing that it needs to have. Um, it has a really good quality reputable brand, which you really need to be careful with because out of spec bolt will fail on you very, very shortly. But anyway, what it actually has that makes it enhanced is really important for especially shorter rifles is it's a little bit heavier. Um, so it has a little bit extra weight and mass to it uh, back here in the rear, as well as the design of it is basically allows for less surface area actually touching the rifle. So that is a couple things. One, more mass, less surface area equals a more, there, there's going to be more ability for it to tame the overgassing nature of a suppressed rifle. So that's really nice in tuning it. Even if you're unsuppressed, um, it's going to not have as many touching parts on your rifle, which is going to allow for smoother cycling, and a little bit nicer recoil. I don't know if I really feel it, but they have some science and data that says that it does, so that's a nice feature. To me though, the increased mass on a bolt carrier is really nice for shooting suppressed and shooting unsuppressed. If you tune your rifle around this bolt, you can, again, reduce the felt recoil. So it's a really nice feature. If you're not shooting suppressed, I do not recommend one of these. I think you can put the money better somewhere else. And uh, if you're curious, what bolt carrier should I get? Again, I can do a whole video on 
um, what different testings mean, what they do, what different finishes do, um, so on and so forth. Um, you don't need a chromed one, you don't need this or that. A good quality mil spec melanided and tested bolt carrier is gonna do you right. There's a company called Toolcraft. Um, they're kind of the industry standard. Uh, they pretty much make them for everyone. Brownells, Arrow, like I can go through. I think some Celebrity Gunworks. Uh, pretty much everyone um, just gets Toolcraft to make their uh, their um, parts for their bulk area groups and they either assemble it or they buy them completely assembled by Toolcraft. So um, buy a Toolcraft. Uh, Brownells sells their variant of it. Very inexpensive. Uh, I think Arrows are also Toolcraft. Where you can just buy, you look up Toolcraft. Really good company to go with. Another good company is Sons of Library Gunwork, everything they sell, BCM, everything they sell, pretty much I recommend. But when you're buying bolts and barrels, please, 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 please do your due diligence. And if you have questions, leave a comment here and I will pr proudly answer them. But buy a good quality bolt, buy a good quality barrel. Those are the two most important things. And moving on, I have another little awesome little upgrade. It's expensive, you don't necessarily need it. A standard T handle is perfectly adequate for your charging handle because ideally after you charge your weapon once, the only other time you ever charge your weapon is gonna be an administrative move. If you're getting malfunctions, you do need to charge your rifle. But again, we're trying to build your rifle so it never malfunctions, which is completely possible. So do not invest money into this that you could have invested in a better bolt, a better trigger, better barrel. That being said, these things are awesome. Uh, this is a Radian, another great company. Arrow now makes an ambidextrous, everyone, guys, everyone and their mom now makes ambidextrous um, bolt catches, sorry, bolt catches, um, charging handles. And so basically it just means that uh, one-handed manipulation, either side of the rifle you pull this on, it will unlock and allow you to pull your bolt back and reciprocate your bolt to start the functioning of the rifle again, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, anyway. This is the Radian SD. What's cool about it is I compared it to Geisley and the traditional Radian. It does what it sells. Um, so it has these little ports in it. I don't know if you can see on the camera too well. Uh, as well as a shelf back here. And what that does essentially is, um, if you're curious what sling, Blue Force Tactical. Um, anyway, um, what it does is this area back here, the back of this, uh, when the rifle fires, if you're shooting suppressed, is the area that is gonna spit gas into your eyes. It makes it uncomfortable. So if you're shooting suppressed, your whole goal is to eliminate gas from coming out here and you want gas going out the end of the barrel, out the end of the gas block, comes later, I'll explain what I mean by that, or out all the extra gas that shouldn't really be in this rifle in the first place, it needs to go out the dust cover. So that's what that does is essentially it gives a bunch of different ways for that gas to escape out the dust cover as opposed to into your eyes. And it does, in my opinion, massively reduce the discomfort you experience while shooting suppressed. It's awesome. I highly recommend you get it if you're shooting suppressed. And uh, if you're not shooting suppressed, don't waste your money. <laughs> but again, a nice little feature. Um, awesome little part. Um, as far as the upper receiver itself, as we get into it here, uh, this is an Arrow M4E1 upper. I bought them as a matching set back when it wasn't the COVID, Rona, whatever uh, that's going on now. Uh, so prices were reasonable. I was able to get this matching set for literally $110. It was awesome. I don't recommend the M4E1 upper set because it doesn't provide anything other than um, this doesn't have a roll pin. But again, if you're building on your kitchen table, I do recommend it. But this doesn't have a roll pin. It just has a set screw. None of those features I told you in the lower really extend to the upper. It's just cosmetic. The, the lower won't match your upper if you buy a traditional upper, but any upper will work with it. So this one, I think now is like an extra 30 to $40. It's not really worth it. Um, if you can find it for like 10 bucks, cosmetically, it will match the cool lines of the lower. And so cosmetically is a huge improvement in my opinion. So that's, that's nice. And again, it has this set screw as opposed to a roll pin, which it makes installation and building this a little bit easier. Uh, back here, I have a Strike Industries forward assist because it's cringy and funny and it makes people mad because Strike Industries, lol. Um, I'm a big forward assist fan. I don't wanna get into that. That's a, like I've said probably 20 times. That's another video. I like forward assist. If you're not a absolute buffoon, there is applications for it. 
another video. <laughs> uh, this is my cringe dust cover because uh, you can't be an American and not love cringy dust covers. So here's my cross rifle American flag dust cover. Um, yeah, that's pretty much my upper. Uh, there's really nothing else on here, and I have still managed to kill nine minutes. So I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next part of this, and if you're still here, or if that is the part you're interested in, I really appreciate that. I cannot believe you, uh, I'm running out of air in this garage. I told you before, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna suffocate myself. <laughs> See you guys in the next production. Okay, so I just uh, recorded this once and I'm gonna go ahead and do it again because that took like 45 minutes. I'm gonna make this a little bit more brief and uh, if you're staying tuned, this next part is gonna cover barrel, handguard, and uh, that's about it. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and take the suppressor off here. Uh, we'll talk about that in the accessories part. But um, what you can see here is a MCMR. Uh, it is a by Bravo Company. It's a Bravo Company MCMR, and it is their 10. Their 10 is actually 10 and a half inches, so it perfectly marries with an 11 and a half inch barrel. Cool thing about the MCMR is, I promise you, I every rifle I own has a different handguard because I've tried to tried to I've tried them all. Uh, SLR, Hodge, uh, Geisley, uh, Midwest Industries. I've had a ton. I like pretty much all the modern ones are great. This one though maintains a zero on my laser, which is there, a lot of them don't, um, as well as it's pretty inexpensive, has M-Lock all around it, it's extremely light, and um, it has anti-rotation tabs on it again to help maintain the zero. And it's cheap, um, and it's slim, I can keep going on. In my opinion, if you're gonna get a handguard on a modern rifle, get the MCMR, price to performance, there's nothing better on the market. Now, uh, underneath that handguard, there is a uh, gas tube by YHM. Uh, it's a simple nitrided gas tube. That kind of doesn't matter. Just pick a good, uh, a good gas tube, um, and it is a carbine length. I have a carbine length gas system. Uh, that gas tube is attached to a superlative arms adjustable gas block. I know a bunch of red flags and hate comments are always flying below. Adjustable gas blocks lower your reliability of your rifle. It adds so. If you're not familiar, usually a gas block, essentially, there's a hole in your barrel where when the bullet passes that hole, there's gonna be gas pushing that bullet. Some of that gas is going to, instead of continuing to push the bullet, it's gonna escape into that hole, and that gas block literally just makes it redirect from up to back down the gas tube. So traditionally speaking, a gas block, uh, it doesn't affect anything on your rifle. When you have an adjustable gas block, what's gonna happen is, this is your barrel, right? And so this suppressor is your barrel. There's a little hole at the top here in the adjustable gas block. There'll be a set screw that will slightly cover the hole depending on how much you screw in. It'll make the hole smaller. And if you screw out, it won't make the hole bigger, but it'll leave it in its more natural open state. So essentially what that does is allow you to have less gas go into your system and um, less gas back here means a less violent, less dirty action. Problem is, is that screw uh, sometimes tightens itself and gets rid of all gas on your rifle. If it loosens all the way to, that screw can come out and then there's that big hole where the screw's supposed to go and all the gas will escape that way, again, making your rifle completely unable to be used. So it is a point on the rifle that can reduce functionality. Um, like to start out by saying, uh, for a gas blocks, you need to do something called dimpling it. Uh, dimpling your barrel uh, in order to have the set screws go in and I highly recommend pinning them as well um, A lot of people are like you don't need to pin it the set screws do fine. I guess uh, Putting a pin in it makes it mechanical. It, it makes it impossible to fail more or less. Although if you do it incorrectly, you're gonna cause a Bump inside your rifling that it's gonna have to get fire lapped and I don't want to get too far into that but more or less have a competent, skilled person, um, or go to Harbor Freight and get drill press. Don't do that. Uh, I would never do anything like that. Um, also, it provides an incredible amount of freedom I would like to not get into in this video. Uh, pin your gas blocks, I highly recommend it. Dimple your barrels as well. Two is better than one, one is none, whatever. Anyway, um, Back to gas blocks. Uh, people say it's not reliable. Superlative Arms, uh, the gas block I have on here, that set screw itself has a dimple sitting on, or is, has essentially little ratchets on it, and there is a, just like the PWS ratcheting castle nut, a ball detent. 
So you can't actually have that come loose or tighten. And what's really cool about it is when it actually, um, it can't loosen, it, when it actually starts to loosen, what it does is it goes into the bleed off mode and it can never get to a point where your rifle can't function. I don't wanna to get too far into this and explain it, but what's really cool is not only can it really mechanically not allow, although all mechanical devices can fail, very unlikely. Anyway, not only is it exceedingly hard for the superlative arm system to fail, it has a second function. Not only does it just cover that hole, like I said before, this is your hole, this is the set screw, making the hole bigger or larger, or bigger or the same. Uh, so it makes the hole smaller if you want it smaller and you can make it perfectly the size that you want. Not only does it have that function, it has another function where the set screw can come out and there's another hole so the gas goes up and out the front, so it goes both out the front and out the back. It's called bleed off. Tiny little itty bitty hole that you can adjust the size of that hole that's on the front of this gas block. So what's cool is I don't use it personally uh, because on a shorter barrel I like the velocity. If you're on like a 16 inch, I use it on a 16 inch barrel. What it does is with a 16 inch barrel, usually this hole, um, depending when it's suppressed, is not really big enough for I'm saying it's not big. How do I say this? This hole is perfectly fine. You get a nice, reliable rifle like I do on my 16 inch. I don't need to make it smaller. But there's a lot of extra gas when you put that suppressor on it. There's a couple things you could do. Uh, that being said, what you can do is you can open up that hole in the front on this gas block and allow some of it to spit out the gas block. And what that does is it means you don't really have to change anything. You still get that nice same amount of pressure you do on that bullet. So again, what happens is more, more gas that goes into uh, your gas block when you um, leave it open, less gas is behind the bullet. So uh, if you start closing it like you do with a traditional gas block, you close it, less gas goes into your system and more of it is gonna go behind your bullet, increasing velocity. But, so it's nice because it makes your bullet faster, but what that does is every action has a reaction. It makes your recoil a little bit sharper. So what this does is allows you to get rid of some of that extra gas in the rifle without having to throw it behind the bullet, making a little bit sharper recoil, or throwing it into your, gas, your system. So it basically is a third alternative to recoil mitigation. If that's blown past you, let me know. I can make a whole different series in this. Last time I tried to explain it, it took me like 45 minutes. Anyway, it's a really cool system. On this, I don't actually use the bleed off because the extra velocity of an adjustable gas block is another great function of it. And it helps me get past that 2750 more reliably. But it also allows me to have a smaller hole there that takes less gas into the system and again, help tune it. So uh, if you're kind of keeping track of suppressor tuning checklist here, I have a Veltor system. I have an adjustable buffer weight system in here. So I have a Geisley spring and a Veltor buffer, uh, both of which help reduce recoil from the suppressor being added. I have a heavier bolt, uh, bolt carrier group with the CMC enhanced, and I also have an adjustable gas block. Uh, those are four features that help me tame recoil, and that's kind of one of the reasons why when you see me shoot it, this thing shoots like a, um, a feather. You know, it shoots like a feather, because feathers shoot. Anyway, uh, so that's that. Um, inside here is a 11 and a half inch barrel. Uh, I don't want to get too high into it. Uh, I kind of skipped around because again, I just did a 45 minute section. But your whole goal here is to get your bullet in around 2750. People ask why, well, um, boat tail hollow point 5.56 or whatever 5.56 you're using, uh, more than likely 55 grain or 62 grain for that matter if you're using green tip. Most bullets are 55 grain. Uh, XM193 uh, is gonna be the average loading that majority of people get their hands on. Great round, I highly recommend it. Don't recommend using green tip indoors. I would recommend using XM193, which is a 55 grain uh, bullet, as it is gonna do something called fragment. And what fragment is, is what Eugene Stoner designed this rifle to do, and this cartridge, I don't think he did. I, I don't wanna get too far into history, I'm not forgotten weapons. Anyway, 5.56 is not designed to be a bowling ball. It is a 22.23 caliber, it's about a 22 caliber bullet. It's a tiny, 
tiny bullet, not terribly heavy, about 55 grains to put that into context. A nine millimeter is on average 115 to 124 grain. It's a tiny bullet, but it goes about 2750 feet per second. That's what it's designed to do. And at that speed, it's gonna kind of explode. I don't wanna say like explosion, like uh, it's not like a hand grenade. What it does is it fragments into a bunch of different fragments and those fragments all do different damage on the interior. And what that does is instead of if you hit, you know, above heart, for instance, the bullet can fragment and part of it can go into heart causing a fatal shot that wouldn't otherwise be fatal. As well as when it actually fragments, it's gonna allow better terminal ballistics and it's gonna fragment in the body and not pass through into your wall um, or whatever it may be, your sum. And so that's a really good feature of a bullet when a home defense situation is uh, being proposed. So with that being said, when you get into 10.3 inch barrels, a little bit more difficult to get that velocity without a suppressor especially, not to mention there's something called dwell time. So we just talked about it uh, with the gas block. And what's gonna happen is, again, you have your barrel here and you have your bullet, right? Well, remember there's that hole on top of the barrel and wherever that hole is, it needs to be brought back far enough that the bullet is still in the barrel forcing the energy of that gas to go into your rifle. And so if the hole is right here and the bullet just bloop, pops out, that gas won't have enough time to be forced into the rifle. And that's called dwell time. If this is blowing your mind, let me know, leave a comment below and I'll do a whole video on dwell time and I'll annoy and bore the crap out of 90% of you, but the other 1% of you that is left, it's like me, this is awesome, I'll eat this crap up. Anyway, um, so with a 10.3 inch barrel, uh, it's also gonna have the hole in the barrel at the same point as this 11.5 is, but it's gonna have less barrel. It's designed to have one of these. This is a suppressor. It's not rifled, it's a bigger hole, it's, it's more or less a muffler. So it's not exactly, you know, this is a six inch suppressor. It's not gonna have six inches worth of barrel. But more or less a six inch suppressor would be, I don't wanna do the math, like 1.3 inches of barrel. Um, and so you do the math at 10.3 with a six inch suppressor, which they were designed for, is about an 11 and a half inch barrel, right? Uh, so yeah, the 11.5 is gonna allow you to shoot reliably unsuppressed whereas a 10.3 does not shoot reliably unsuppressed. Whether or not uh, you believe that or not is up to you, but it doesn't. So I highly recommend an 11.5 because the shorter you go, the more compact the rifle will be. And um, we're learning now more and more that an 11 half inch barrel um, is gonna allow you to get terminal ballistics that are adequate up to like 500 yards. I've shot this 500 yards, it's still accurate. Um, what's also cool is people don't know this, shorter barrels are inherently more accurate than longer barrels. A short, thick, Chody barrel is actually easier to make accurate. The longer the barrel is, the harder it is to make accurate. So people think that an 11 and a half inch barrel will be less accurate. No, that's not true. It'll have less velocity. And again, so the more that barrel, that bullet spins, the faster it gets. So the faster it gets, the more velocity, you know, the faster it is, not the more accurate. Shorter barrels are actually more accurate, generally. And what's cool about that is once it starts slowing down, because as soon as the barrel, the bullet leaves the barrel, there's something called external ballistics. If you're not familiar with what that is, when the bullet leaves the barrel, there is air in this atmosphere, there is gravity in this planet, and there is, um, I don't even want to get into it. I, there's a Coriolis effect. You know, I don't want to get into it. This is some cool sniper stuff. But anyway, um, as soon as that bullet leaves the barrel, it starts losing velocity when it starts going below something called supersonic, you know, the sound barrier, uh, it becomes significantly less accurate. So the farther you shoot with a short barrel compared to a long barrel, that bullet will have less velocity, then become less accurate once it gets past that, if that makes any sense. So up until a certain point, an 11 and a half inch barrel will be just as accurate, if not more accurate than a 16 inch barrel. And if you're shooting past 500, 600 yards, that's when you should go with a longer barrel. If you were like 90% of us, we don't even have access to that far, and there's no reason for you to go with a longer barrel. Fair, capiche, makes sense? Don't agree with me? 
Google it, and if you find my, fa inc my, my information incorrect, please leave a comment below. I will gladly um, provide you with uh, an argument against that. Anyway, um, so that's enough about it. Uh, I went with Roscoe Manufacturing. It's a nitride barrel. Uh, another argument here is nitride versus chrome. Chrome is a process that has been used pretty much by all militaries, including on AKs, whatever. Uh, it is uh, an electroplating process that is going to provide uh, a easier surface to clean, as well as it's going to provide a stronger and harder surface than bare metal. You can't use a bare metal barrel unless you're doing precision stuff. I don't want to get too far into it because that metal, um, when that bullet passes through it, it starts to erode the barrel because it's a high pressure. Again, this is 2750. Barrels have a shelf life. The thinner they are, generally speaking, the lower it is, but even more depending on the coating. The problem with chrome is it actually adds material, and when you're adding material, you're losing accuracy. So it's very, very difficult and very expensive to make a good chrome lined barrel that is both durable and accurate. FN, a couple other manufacturers do that. Those barrels are around $300 to $350. The nitriding is a process that used to kind of just be the bottom of the barrel. Uh, it wasn't strong, but modern nitriding processes are, um, I don't say equally, but very close to as strong as chrome lining, while not providing or not adding as much material as chroming does. So arguably and inherently, they're more accurate, while almost as durable. And here's the kicker: even though it has maybe a 10 to 15 percent lower life, depending, uh, I, I don't know. That's just a number I'm throwing out. They're about 50% of the cost. This barrel here is a nitrided Roscoe manufacturing barrel. I'm gonna play some video here. I can stack holes with it at 25 yards easily and I can still stack holes with it probably out to 100. I actually, to be honest with you, I've only really shot 500. I, I actually never put it on paper at 100. I'll, I owe you that. Anyway, this thing is accurate as all heck. It's a great company that manufactures for All right, guys. I'm in bottom of diamond. Too far into it, or what they do, or whatever. It's Let's see how we do. Lowers. A lot of companies get blanks, just like a lot of companies get forgings and finish it. Blah blah. Another video. But what's really really cool is Roscoe is basically an OEM that just started selling their own about a year ago. They're extremely accurate barrels, extremely high quality. Mm, not bad. They have that really great gas port size, that hole you start with. So. Um, even if you don't decide to put a can on it, if you just throw this barrel on, you don't have to get an adjustable gas block. It's a really good gas port size. Again, I can get into that in explaining the minutia of it. And it's heavier barrel, uh, which again, heavier barrels, thicker, chody barrels are inherently more accurate. So it's a win-win-win all the way around. And um, your company that actually puts that rifling in that barrel is really going to have direct quality control over your accuracy. They do a really good crowning on this barrel. I can get into it. It's an awesome, wonderful barrel. They're for like 120 to 140 bucks. You're not gonna get better than that. Price to performance, it's outstanding. It's an accurate, great, great barrel. I highly recommend Roscoe Manufacturing. So, okay. I hope I didn't kill you guys. We're really far into this segment. I'm gonna go ahead and cut it here. I know you guys are gonna have questions. Please leave them below. And um, if you have anything to debate with me, please, please, please let me know. All right, guys. So if you've watched this whole thing back to back, I am incredibly impressed. I'm getting tired even to filming it. But um, we're going to get to the last section of this uh, Dewall AR-15 build. And this is going to be accessories. So. Um, Start with the suppressor because it's in my hand. Um, it's a Saker 5.56K. Uh, guys, a lot of people ask me about suppressors. I generally don't recommend a single can thing. I have the money that I can buy a can for this particular rifle, get my home defense rifle. For if I ever use it, it gets confiscated. I have other cans that will do the same job for my other rifles. Um, not to mention, again, uh, every dollar I put into this build, uh, I justify it as it's for the defense of me and my family. Anyway. This is a 5.56K. If you really look into it compared to Surefire, other cans, um, me having shot most of them as well, I think the tone on this is incredibly good. Um, it is full auto rated. It is made out of some really impressive materials. I can get into suppressor comparisons, but the Saker series is literally indestructible. Lovely series. Other than the, the finish on it, which I'm going to Cerakote it. I'll do a video on that. Um, 
I've never had a single problem with it. I love it. Uh, I did not like the ASR mount. I'll take that back. And I did change it out with a dead air mount. Um, and that'll bring me to the flash hider I got on here. Um, I have a flash hider. Um, the only purpose of this flash hider is to mount my suppressor. Uh, I probably should have used a compensator, but uh, I shoot it on suppressor every once in a while. So uh, again, I don't really recommend compensators on non-competition rifles for 5.56, um, especially short ones. People ask me, why don't I put a compensator? Well, especially if you're indoors, you're going to go deaf, even with hearing protection. is un completely unruly. Uh, 556 inherently has relatively low recoil, so you don't necessarily get as much benefit from it. But um, when it comes to 556, especially out of shorter barrels, you're going to get a lot of flash. And that flash, especially at night, will blind you, uh, especially when you're shooting suppressed. Uh, there's a lot of reasons not to. I generally recommend, uh, if you're asking me what the best multiple device is, uh, if you don't have a suppressor, use a birdcage. A2 birdcages, they might not look as sexy. They're extremely good. They're actually partially compensators, the way they work. The military spent a lot of money on making a wonderful muzzle device that is extremely inexpensive. I don't recommend them though because I recommend a suppressor. Uh, I know John Lovell says you shouldn't use a suppressor indoors because your neighbors can't hear. I think he's probably shot suppressed indoors way more than I have. My neighbors will still hear. <laughs> it's not, uh, this is not a pleasant rifle to shoot indoors and even suppressed it is still quite loud. Not to mention if I'm shooting and the bad guys aren't shooting, they're dead. If they shoot, they're probably not shooting suppressed. My neighbors will hear. You know what I mean? Um, they'll be yelling, they'll be whatever. But here's the thing. If I'm shooting indoors, I would like to, first of all, not have it as traumatic for my family with that loud noise. Second of all, I would like to maintain as best as I can my hearing because I'm going to be butt-ass naked running around with this. I would like to maintain my hearing so when the police tell me to drop my weapon, I don't get shot. There's a lot of other reasons, um, but... Flash mitigation is a huge one. It actually uh, is going to improve the velocity or increase the velocity of your bullet. It's going to reduce flash, so uh, your eyes don't adjust as poorly. Um, it's going to be a lot easier to shoot under night vision. Uh, actually, can help reduce recoil. I can get into a lot of things, but suppressors are an absolute improvement in every way, other than weight in the front for a gun. Now. Moving on past that, this thing hanging out past it is called a Mod Light PLH V2. This is an extremely expensive, but by far, I've owned every light on the market. I've had Aerosaka lights, I've had the Cloud Defense OWL, I've had uh, pretty much all the Surefire uh, offerings in the Scout form. Um, and I think the Mod Light PLH V2 has killed them all. I actually used to do some videos on YouTube or Facebook, I had to dig them up on my phone and maybe make a more professional one for YouTube. Um, but this thing kills the cloud defense uh, in a lot of ways, the OWL. Um, and I haven't had the rain yet, I'll get one and compare it, but as of now this is wonderful. Uh, the tail cap I have on it actually is the DS00 from Surefire, which has a actual button as well as a tape switch um, compatible lead, which I have on a mod button. So I just have a simple little button back here uh, that you press and it turns on the light and that's it. There is no... Uh, permanent on. There's no reason to have a permanent on. If I ever did, for some weird freaking reason, I could press the DS00, which I never will use ever. Um, I don't have a tape switch on the light. Again, with this 11.5, I want to have my hand. The further out your hand is, um, it's going to allow you to better, uh, it's going to allow you to better, uh, how do I say this? Control your rifle. Uh, the further out your hand is on the rifle uh, without overextending your arm, because you don't want to be completely bent, but majority of bent. Uh, the further out your hand is on the rail, the better you're going to be able to control the rifle and more likely the more accurate you're going to be able to be uh, while utilizing it. So uh, having that tape switch would push back some of my other buttons and have me put my hand further back so I don't use it. Uh, and so I like to have the um, actual physical button here on the top for my laser. And there's also one on the back with these Zeneco Purse 3s, which is what this laser is. Wonderful laser. Um, zero comes off just a little bit with hard use, but other than that, I love it. I owe oh, you guys some night vision videos, and if that's something you guys are interested in, um, you know, I have some really good night vision. I can also have recorders with it. I can go ahead and do some videos on that. But um, wonderful device uh, if you're a civilian looking to buy one. There is no better device on the market than this because it's full power. Uh, this thing eats a mall alive, mall C. Um, the, non-civilian version of the mall eats this alive, but it's also four times the cost, and uh, they don't sell to civilians. 
So, uh, Zeneco does. <laughs> so, I'll leave it at that. Um, the sling I have for this rifle uh, is the Blue Force Gear Vickers Tactical 221. Um, awesome sling. I use the padded because uh, I'm weak and I love it. All the other slings on the market pretty much do the same thing. They have the QD, two QD points and a slider and uh, sling is a sling is a slung. They all copied Vickers. <laughs> They're all great. Um, you know, so there's a lot on the market, but get you a good two point sling. Um, generally speaking, you're going to want to have the slings as far apart as physically possible. Uh, it's going to provide you with less chance of hitting your nuts. I don't, don't use a single point sling and I don't recommend having your slings, you know, all the way up on the rifle. The further apart they are, you can actually throw your rifle over your back. A lot of other things, uh, I got taught that in the military and that's kind of what I go to when I teach people. Uh, to keep their slings kind of as far apart as they can on the rifle uh, without it getting in the way. Uh, so with that being said, the MCMR comes with a, a QD socket and I have the QD socket literally all the way up and I will throw in the sling there and put the other sling here. All right, so now I got to talk about the arguably third most important thing on this rifle. Uh, first most important in my opinion is bolt, second being barrel, and third, the thing that's going to make the biggest difference is absolutely going to be, uh, again, what I just did here, it's just kind of got the sling out of the way. Anyway, the th third most important thing that's going to directly make this rifle more of a violent, efficient, and deadly thing is going to be your optic. Uh, I do not think that LPVOs are for a vast majority of people. Uh, I think that they are inherently better than red dots in a lot of situations, um, but a vast majority of them, I think a red dot is going to be better. I have both. I like running, ideally, uh, not on my home defense setup because it's a little bit heavy and I'm not gearing towards ever having to shoot past 300 yards. It's the other thing. LPVOs really get into their own past about 300. Uh, 300 at the end, you're completely able to do with a red dot and you can possibly identify three to 500 easily with a 3x magnifier. You can shoot 500 and in easily with a red dot and magnifier. Although LPVOs are quick. They're not as quick as red dots. Uh, they're going to be heavier, although this setup with the magnifier and red dot, some of them are lighter. Uh, anyway, they're going to be significantly more expensive. Uh, this is the creme de la creme. It is an EOTech and a Aimpoint T2. And I got the T2 used for about $500. Uh, I don't know if you can still get that now with COVID, but even new, $700. And a G22, which is the G, or G30, G30, is a G33 without the plastic armor. You can get those for like 250 bucks or something like that. I don't know, 200, whatever. Um, add the amount of your choice, although both of them come with one. Uh, you're, you're in not that expensive for pretty much the cream of the crop in the red dot market. You don't need to do that either. You can get a primary arms for 150 bucks and you can get a magnifier, which I don't really recommend. Most people don't need a magnifier, but if you want one, you can get a good magnifier again from primary arms for 150 bucks. Uh, so you're in about $300. A good quality LPVO that is bare minimum going to be uh, able to be used up close is going to be at least $1,000. And even those are going to suck up close, they're going to have a crappy eye box, crappy parallax. Um, a lot of things, issues, they, they can't be used up close. Uh, you're going to want an offset red dot. And at that point, it's another thing to learn, harder to teach, more rounds down range you need to go through the rifle so that way you understand it. I don't recommend LPVOs to majority of civilian shooters other than those who really can put the time and effort to maximize it. Not only that, the reason I don't use one on my home defense rifle is I also have a night vision setup. And with that being said, it's nearly impossible to passively aim through a LPVO. I don't want to get too far into that. Again, a little bit more advanced setting, but uh, it's kind of cylindrical, you know what I'm saying? Uh, novice shooters, I recommend a red dot. Pretty advanced shooters, I recommend an LPVO. Even more advanced when you get into the red dot, I, you, or when you get into night vision and such, you go ahead and go back to your red dot, but, uh, or both, like I have. I have a 1x10 with a RMR um, on a badger ordnance mount. But anyway, I recommend a red dot. And I recommend as good as you can afford, but not too much. Bolt first, get the best bolt that you want. Again, pass, uh, get a good tool craft bolt. Barrel, get a good BA or Roscoe, or a good quality nitrided barrel. 
and then whatever you have left that you know you don't mind chunking away at get a good red dot primary arms and anything made by hollow sun which i think primary arms is the sigil series those good 150 dollars red dots will serve you well i don't recommend an lpvo to most people uh, i can do a whole series on that i do not recommend an eotech either if you have the big baller money uh, i can do a whole series on that i have them i love them they're good optics for the vast majority of people it's just going to be overly complicated so that's that Anyway, so that's the optic. Uh, the reason I chose this particular one, I'll tell you why I did. Um, T2, this is my home defense rifle. I got the best optic on the market, in my opinion. Uh, and I put it on this because, uh, again, this is my home defense weapon. I don't like the EOTEX. I don't like the aspect that when I pull my rifle, not only do I have to worry about whatever the situation is, I also have to remember to turn on the optic because it doesn't have an auto, or it, ha it turns off by itself. and it has a pretty abysmal battery life. I leave this one on in a setting I know I can blast a white a wall with my light and still see the red dot, and it'll last me a couple years. I never have to turn it off. Um, that's awesome. Uh, also, it's compatible with these awesome risers from uh, Unity. It's called the Fast Mount. If you see, it's up higher. The reason it's up higher is uh, when I'm using electronic ear protection, uh, I don't have to squish it into the stocks. It's more comfortable. Um, as well as night vision, uh, it allows my night vision to clear my stock and the magnifier here and be able to still passively aim with this red dot. Awesome. When I wear a gas mask, if I wear a gas mask, I don't have to squish up against the stock and push the gas mask, potentially break the seal. Um, not only that, uh, it also provides, even without all of those last things I said, if you're just an average civilian shooter, if you notice, my head is already, or my eyes are already in line with this optic. Um, I don't have to tilt my head in any way, bring a rifle to shoulder, I can see dot. Traditionally, you have to squinch a little bit, and that's going to cause a crank in your neck, and it's going to not only slow you down, it's going to be uncomfortable over long periods and strengths of fire, uh, as opposed to this. Once you go to a tall giraffe mount, you never go back. The only drawback being you're going to have higher height over bore, and what that means is your bore is your barrel. Uh, it's a fancy word for that. Uh, and the uh, optic, higher up it is, up close. Shoot, I'm going down a rabbit hole. Anyway, <laughs> okay, so this line is optic. Optic has to be aimed down in order to match your barrel. Think of your optic, it's a laser beam. Your optic never changes. Your bullet never goes up, but as soon as it leaves the barrel, it starts going down. So you have to pick a point where you aim down and match the bullet. And that is your zero. So, you know, usually like so 25 yards is what the average American does or 36 now is becoming popular or 50, whatever. You pick your zero. You pick your poison, right? So, uh, aim down, optic shoot, right? So, it hits in point of convergence. Problem is when you're back here. So, okay. So, this is 25 yards, right? They, they touch. Here's bullet, optic. They touch, right? These are two lines. When you go back here, here's optic, here's bullet. Does that make sense? So boom, they touch here at 25 yards, back here, optic, bullet. So what that means is you have to aim high back here for your bullet to hit correctly. Um, a lot of very ignorant people are going to teach you that your bullet rises when it leaves a barrel. That's nonsense. Your bullet doesn't rise. Ask any pitcher ever. It's physically impossible to throw a baseball curving up. Whatever. I don't want to get too far into this, but it's against the laws of physics. That bullet does not rise. It drops. Your optic, though, has to be zeroed low. So, up close, the higher this is, the more divergence from your point of impact or your bullet is. Right? So, it basically means uh, that you have to aim even higher. So traditionally speaking, uh, what we teach in the military is, uh, we call it a credit card. Uh, you, you aim a credit card high up close with a M68, which is the red dot that we use. Uh, so uh, kill shot indoors, uh, you generally aim head or T. Uh, and if you're aiming T, you aim uh, about neck. And for an individual to do headshot, uh, you usually can aim around tip of scalp or forehead, and uh, when you're using this sight, one of the negatives to it, or sorry, this uh, optic mount is it's going to be a little bit higher, so you're going to have to aim above the head, um, or you can aim hairline and generally get 
uh, nose mouth shots. Um, so it's a little bit more advanced, a little bit more complicated of a technique, and I've probably blown past a lot of you guys. But yeah, uh, I generally do not recommend a um, too low of a sight, because again, the lower you go, the more you have to crunch, and um, I generally actually don't recommend uh, too high of a sight for entry-level shooters, just because you have to learn that offset. Again, if you guys would like me to explain more about ballistics and really explain a deep dive, I could do a really cool, really good like entry level to ballistics that um, I actually think I have the uh, slides from when I was in sniper section still somewhere in my email. So I can pull that up and do a whole class on this if that's something you guys are interested in. Um, but yeah, uh, again, I pretty much got to the end of this and towards the end here, I'm sure you just heard me start babbling and words came out of my mouth. I love this. I eat this crap up. This is my whole life. I don't have a hobby aside from shooting and building guns. Uh, I drive a Ford Taurus. Um, I don't care. Uh, I'm not a car guy. I'm not. I'm a computer nerd a little bit, but this is my hobby. This is what I do. So, um, I really appreciate you guys tuning in. If you guys have any questions or just anything you guys want a video on or uh, anything that you want to clarify or. Whatever it is, you stuck around long enough. I have no idea how, and I really appreciate it, but um, I would love to uh, be able to spend some more of my free time discussing things and sneaking in the comment and having some good conversation with you guys.